Welcome to our conversation with Dr. Roberto Abadi, uh, our conversation on risk and the coronavirus. We are recording on the morning of March 26th because I was stupid enough to not press the record button last night when Dr. Abadi gave his fantastic talk and conversation uh, the night of March 25th. So we're recording the first few minutes that I missed uh, and hopefully it won't pose too much trouble as you're watching. There'll be a slight jump uh, to connect with the video from last night. Uh, Dr. Roberto Abadi is research assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. He received his PhD in anthropology at the City University of New York's Graduate Center, and he is the author of The Professional Guinea Pig, Big Pharma and the Risky World of Human Subjects. Uh, Abadi's book uh, received the Best Book of the Year Award from the Medical Sociology Section of the British Sociological Association. He's also done extensive research with people who inject drugs in Puerto Rico, looking at how social inequalities shape practices of drug use and risk, um, and building off research that he uh, conducted in Uruguay more than two decades ago. He will be talking about a number of topics, including risk, coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, and what anthropologists, and specifically public anthropologists, should be doing in this moment of pandemic. Thank you very much for joining us, uh, Roberto. It's really a pleasure. Uh, we've known each other for now almost two decades, and uh, uh, you are always so insightful, and I really appreciate your coming back to talk uh, again after uh, the terrific conversation last night. Thank you for inviting me, David. Really a pleasure to be here. And also, uh, thank you for the opportunity because, you know, these are very anxious times uh, for everybody. But, um, you know, the way academics, we deal uh, with anxiety and the unknown is by researching, by reading, by talking, by thinking about uh, what's, uh, you know, what's going on. And uh, this uh, is a collective process. It's not just an individual thing. So being able to join all of you and to, you know, exchange some of the ideas about risk and uh, epidemics and politics um, is very uh, therapeutic and it's very useful. I, I hope, you know, people in the academic community keeps these conversations uh, going. I'm going to introduce just uh, some basic ideas about critical medical anthropology. Um, that's an approach that I take to risk. Uh, it's not the only one. The, the other major one is a social constructionist approach. Um, my approach to critical medical anthropology is um, maybe not mainstream in, in medical anthropology, but it's very important. And, you know, it's just a particular take on risk. Uh, there are others. I don't buy the social constructionist approach uh, that much because uh, an epidemic, and a deadly epidemic like this one, um, it's very real. It, it, there's something, people get sick, people go to emergency units, people get intubated. If they are lucky, they make it. And if they don't, they die. So all that suffering is real, or the pain is real, the deaths are real. Mm, of course, there's some social constructionist approach. Uh, the discursive dimension of, you know, epidemics is there. Trump saying, you know, the Chinese virus, and then you also have you know, cultural differences. I mentioned in my, in my talk yesterday, Americans going out and buying guns. In addition, toilet paper seems to be a universal, like Levi Strauss would say. But uh, we bought toilet paper and guns. Others bought toilet papers. And let's say in, in, in Holland, they bought toilet papers and pots. And in France, they were worried about baguettes and where baguettes could transmit the virus or not. So there's some cultural particularities in the way we approach risk and coronavirus risk, some particular social anxieties. But I don't want to focus on that representational side of the epidemic. I don't want to focus on the social construction aspect of it. Instead, through critical medical anthropology, that is an approach that focuses on materiality and political economy, I want to outline how not everybody is exposed to risk and particular coronavirus risk in the same way. Risk is not democratic. 
some people are exposed, exposed to risk or risk that some others do not. And also not everybody has the same resources to face risks. So uh, issues of class, gender, or race, even legal status for uh, US, for example, really shape the ways in which people face or go through the coronavirus uh, mayhem or, or experience uh, or adversity. So mm, that's gonna be my talk. Um, I'm just gonna mention briefly my previous work on uh, professional guinea pigs and people who inject drugs, but only to drive the same point home. That is not everybody faces risk or experience risk in the same way. And you know, the, the lower you are in the totem pole, um, the worse off you are when uh, risk uh, situations hits uh, you or you know your society. For the professional guinea pigs, just poor people, uh, unemployed, unemployable people in Philadelphia that were testing drugs for safety. Um, first, these drugs, experimental drugs, are tested in animals, usually dogs and rats, because they're cheap. Monkeys are expensive. Um, they want to make sure it's safe in animals and you know, uh, they also wanna make sure, sure and they need to make sure that it's safe in humans. Let's say it's a, it's a diabetic drug. You, you cannot go from an animal model and an animal uh, testing to uh, uh, somebody with diabetes or cancer or whatever medical condition. First, you have to make sure it's safe and then you wanna make sure it's effective, but that's a later phase, like phase two and three. For phase one, which is the phase I study, um, the only motivation for people, for these people, um, which, which are very healthy, is the money. It's not an altruistic motivation. Um, they are taking on the risks of doing drug development, but the downside for them and the inequality part of this whole thing that I want to focus on is that if the drug is successful, and only one in 10 are, because you have to go from phase one to phase two and then phase three and prove that it's safe and effective, if the drug is effective and goes into, goes into the market, then Mm, they won't be able to afford it because most of the people I study, they don't have health coverage. And, you know, uh, it's just not a reality for them. They all told me, if I get sick, I go to the ER and hope for the best. But if you're a middle class or upper class person and you have a medical plan, then you sit out. You don't take any risk testing any experimental medication. Uh, you let the poor people do it. And if it's successful, when it reaches the market, you go and you buy it out of pocket or you know through your uh, plan. So there's a huge inequality there. And, and I think it, it's the starting of this conversation of how the position you have in society really shapes your risk experience, whether you're gonna take the risk in the first place or the kind of resources you can mobilize um, in the case um, you need uh, to, to face a, a, a risk uh, environment or a risk situation. If it goes into the market, poor people that develop the drug, the guinea pigs, they have no insurance, they cannot afford it. Poor people that were not guinea pigs, they are guinea pigs in a different way, in a system that doesn't provide them health care and leaves them to fend from themselves. Middle class people with health care plans and rich people wait for the guinea pigs to develop the drug and then they just go and buy them or get them through their um, you know, medical plans. So the idea is that there's and an unevenness of risk in this context in which poor people go through the pain and the boredom of being a guinea pig, but they cannot afford the drugs. Wealthy people and middle-class people sit out, uh, wait for the drug to come into the market, and then they buy. For the uh, people who inject drugs uh, in, in Puerto Rico, I wanted to know, you know uh, how being poor homeless, with mental health issues, with other addiction problems, really shape their understanding of risk and you know, the, way, the, the, the kind of things they could manage to mobilize to prevent HIV risk and EPSI risk, which of course is through the uh, syringes, the blood in the syringes, but also uh, the cooker, you know, they use to prepare the drug before injecting the water and the filter, which is a small cotton ball. So, um, one of the things they really like to do in Puerto Rico is to do caballo. Caballo is when they, one or two more people or three more people come together, you know, maybe a, a bag of heroin is five, six, a bag of cocaine, six. Uh, they like to combine heroin and cocaine. Uh, so let's say they need $20, right? You can wait 
until you get twenty dollars, and then you you don't share. You just go, you buy, and then you use your dose. You get cured. But if you don't have twenty dollars, let's say you hustle for an hour, where you're feeling bad, you're feeling sick because heroin uh, produces heroin withdrawal, a very painful symptom. If you're feeling bad, you want to relieve yourself, but you have ten dollars, and then you find your mate that also has ten dollars. You pull the money together, and then you prepare in the same cooker. So everybody can have their own syringe clean, but then you have to prepare in a way that makes unavoidable to share the same preparation equipment. And from there, you know, there's a risk of HIV transmission and EPSI. Um, this is a, like a materialist approach to risk, showing how poverty and other material conditions shape risk outcomes. You know, uh, it's not just people having uh, I'm in, in not the right knowledge about HIV and FC. There are some epidemiologists and public health uh, uh, people that said, oh, maybe they don't know that HIV is transmitted through the syringes and the equipment. Maybe they don't know about the FC. Yeah, they know. They're not dumb. They know, but they are forced to do it because their priority is to avoid the heroin withdrawal symptoms. Uh, so, mm -hmm. Finally, you know, there's this idea about addiction that everybody can become addicted or everybody can. No. For opiate, for example, is mostly rural and poor and young in America. You know, wealth, wealthy people in Wall Street, they, 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 they like cocaine because it gives them this rush and this euphoria and that matches their hyperactivity in, in the stock market. And then they party and it's a very fun drug if you are a wealthy person that doesn't have to think about anything else. So drugs are not equal opportunity and addiction is not an equal opportunity either. Some people are more exposed and have less resources than others. Uh, now, I wanna jump right straight to the coronavirus thing. Uh, right to right, that it's not a social construction. You know, people get infected, they go to the hospital, they die. And of course, there's a representational dimension of it. You know, Trump, I know everybody here, him saying the Chinese virus, the Chinese virus, it's a foreign virus. I didn't do anything. It's not my fault. I did everything right. So there's this representation or this discursive dimension, of course, in a pandemic. Uh, we are social beings after all, and we mobilize symbols and metaphors and everything that we know we do, right? So uh, there's a dimension that is discursive. But that doesn't mean that the virus is entirely constructed or socially constructed. Um, of course, you know, a pandemic like this one, like others, also elicits deep social anxieties. And you're gonna laugh at this. You know, we talk about the, the toilet paper. In the US, guns uh, sold, you know, I don't know if it was twofold or threefold in the last two or three weeks. People are buying fucking guns. Uh, why? They're always buying guns. They feel insecure. They feel that the world is going to end. They want to feel good. And maybe they, they were also looking for an excuse to have another gun. And they just said, oh, there's a coronavirus. We, know they, we are not safe. Uh, let's buy a gun. That's, that's our anxiety. And that's, that's, that's us. In France, uh, people were anxious about baguettes. You know the baguette, the bread? They wanted to know if you could get the virus when you go and you grab a baguette at the bakery. And in Holland, they went to pot um, delivery services, you know, to, uh, and they bought pot. They, they, they stuck at, they, they, instead of buying toilet paper like crazy, they bought a lot of, uh, a big supply of pot. Those that could, of course, you know, they have to have the money, but they bought pot. That's a different anxiety. I'm gonna run off pot. I'm gonna run off baguettes. I'm gonna run off weapons or arms or guns. Uh, so there's a cultural dimension of, uh, of an epidemic. Uh, there, there are social anxieties that are particular. But I think this is an anecdote. It's fun to talk about this. It makes for a fun paper. But you're not getting very deep. Uh, that's my argument. You know, social, con social contractionist, people, contractionist people would totally defer. Um, and they are thinking, focusing on the materiality, focusing on the materiality uh, is missing all these very rich texture, whatever, whatever things. I'm missing. Uh, I'm not totally missing them. I'm, uh, I'm just not placing my attention in, in a, I think a banal kind of thing. So if, if, you're not, if I'm not looking at the constructionist dimension of risk, 
what I'm looking at, this is what I'm looking at, you know, um, the real effects. Uh, they are epidemiological effects, and we all, by now, very familiar, you know, epidemiologists have talked about transmission rates, you know, how transmissible it is, death rates, you know, it's going to kill 1%, 2%, it's going to be 3%. Uh, so there's that dimension, and uh, there's an economic dimension, of course. Uh, hello? Did I lose you? Hey. No, we, we didn't lose you. Ah, good, good. So there's an epidemiological dimension behind this epidemic. There's an economic dimension. How bad can it be? How bad can it get? Uh, Shishek is saying uh, or arguing that this virus can bring the end of capitalism. Other people might disagree, but there's a clear economic uh, dimension behind this and also a political dimension. A lot of us might be wondering, would this finally bring Trump down? Would he be reelected after all? Uh, and also the virus is reconfiguring social life. We are doing Zoom, uh, we are teaching online, we are doing things that we haven't done before. Uh, so those are the obvious effects. But, uh, you know, there's not much I can say about that. What I wanted to focus us is on the deeper cultural effects and meanings of coronavirus in, in, in America, and also in America. I'm not pretending to talk about uh, other contexts or cultures. So um, what, a, what a traumatic event like a pandemic does is uh, show the cracks in a society. You know, we, a society goes almost in automatic mode. We do things, they always, we always do the same things, taking from granted most stuff, uh, but a pandemic ruptures our, you know, ordinary life as everybody knows, right? And it shows things that are hidden. Is there's a hidden script in a society, which is who has the real power? What are the real interests behind uh, certain decisions? But nobody talks about that in a pandemic. Nobody talks about that either, but it becomes very obvious. And I'm gonna give you an example of this. Who's gonna be tested? Who's gonna be on that respirator? There's not enough tests for everybody. Uh, NBA, NBA players have been tested, and I saw people in New Jersey. There's a family in New Jersey that lost four members. And one of the surviving members said, NBA players get tested and they had nothing. They were totally healthy. And we were a very affected family and nobody got tested. Uh, the same thing with respirators. There's not enough respirators for everybody. Who would get that? So uh, it shows that money counts and status counts and social certification counts. The place in your society is gonna determine if you're gonna live or if you're gonna die. So that's what interesting for us as anthropologists in a pandemic, because it makes clear or more obvious uh, things in which, or ways in which a society operates that are usually less transparent. So that's the, that's the important thing for me, uh, being able to look through the pandemic to the issues of power, inequality, and social stratification. Again, very, very different approach than the approach taken by social constructionists. So coming back to this point, not everybody is affected in the same way. You know, uh, and also, there's another thing I think which, which is, that is really, really unfair. It's the poor, it's the rich people and the, the mobile uh, global middle class, the people that traveled to China, the people that went on vacation to Paris. And, and I went there just a few months ago, uh, so I'm including myself there. The people that went to Italy on vacation, the people that went to Spain on vacation and then went, went back to New York, went back to Seattle, went back to California that were the main vac vectors of the virus in the country. On the other hand, the recipients, the victims, uh, are the poor people, the cashiers, the, the delivery guys, the Uber drivers, the, you know, uh, there's uh, a very clear class disparity here. 
uh, a French sociologist I, I heard the other day, she says, it's a class war. And you can see, I have a very clear class uh, dynamic here. The rich and the upper middle class uh, bring the virus and then they can hide. You know, uh, rich people, I, I read this in the New York Times just the other day, uh, in bankers uh, in Wall Street were looking for second homes, trying to go to Connecticut, uh, not, uh, a nice place, right? Uh, and, you know, they had this problem. I mean, not a problem, really. Uh, they had yearly leases, but they wanted to be there only for two or three months. They, they did that. They just went there or they planned to go there for two months, but they would pay an yearly lease just to be there for two months. Other rich people are going to their yachts. They have private islands. Rich people are always isolated from the people anyway. Have you ever seen a rich people in the train in New York City, in the metro in New York City, anywhere in DC? Rich people are naturally isolated. Uh, you know. But the workers, as I said, the medical staff, the nurses, the first responders uh, are always exposed. And uh, it's also very gender, there's a gender dynamic there as well. Most of the nurses, medical staff, cashiers are also women. So uh, you can see that also uh, undocumented uh, workers in the, in the US, they are really exposed because they are working in food preparation and many other services that exposes them disproportionately to uh, the coronavirus risk. So that's a very clear disparity um, when we're looking at, at coronavirus. Mm. That's another thing, you know, uh, we're always, uh, we're all doing, and uh, we've been doing social, social distancing uh, for the past month, past week, past days. Uh, it's easy for us. It's easy for us because we don't have to go to work. We can stay at home and our homes are good. Uh, good, you know, they're warm. We have everything we want in the fridge, the TV, the Netflix, the internet, broadband, the Zoom. We can commute, telecommute and uh, work from home. But, um, you know, if you, if you are poor, uh, you might not have that uh, opportunity. You know, uh, it's very hard to isolate if you have four or five people living or sleeping in the same room, especially if you have to work and then somebody's coming in and out. Uh, food shopping, you know, uh, Costco had lines that were crazy. Uh, that's a middle class spot, Trader Joe's, crazy. But you have to have money to do that. Uh, half of the population in America cannot spend, don't have $400 for an emergency like this one. Half of the population. So um, the idea that you can enact social distancing, uh, it's kind of a weird, not to say problematic. It's a kind of crazy idea, right? That assumes like a middle class livelihood that most people in America do not have right now. Uh, also, think about the homeless. How do you do social distancing in the streets or in a shelter full of other people? Uh, impossible. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a crazy thing, right? So trying to unpack these uh, epidemiological ideas of this social distancing, and uh, prevention, these, these mainstream discourses of public health, I think we, we, we should unpack them and analyze them and, 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 and look at them uh, critically, right? So I, I, I didn't wanna uh, let that uh, go and, and notice. I have just two more things to say. One is the uses of coronavirus. There's a use uh, of this epidemic or this pandemic. Uh, Sadly, uh, white people are freak out, trying to survive, trying to make it, trying not to go crazy. Uh, the capitalist class, the elite, as Naomi Klein has shown 20, 30 years ago with a shock doctrine, are using this event, this pain, to further their agenda. Again, like in 2008, we had another bailout. I think, if I remember correctly, 2008 was a $1 trillion bailout. This one is better for them 
two trillion bailouts. Nothing for workers, nothing for students, no, no debt relief, no nothing. Just drop debt. They don't care. So that's one of the uses of uh, the crisis. There's a more hopeful sign. I'm not too hopeful, but I have to mention it. As you mentioned, David, in the beginning, people distributing toilet paper or volunteering in the community or making a donation to a food bank. I just read today uh, um, in the Guardian that uh, they were taking, they were organizing, community organizers were organizing homeless people in California, taking over vacant homes. They took over 13 vacant homes. Uh, you know, there was a homeless, homeless person, a Latino guy that says, in the street, as a homeless person with diabetes, I would die. Taking over this home gives me hope that I can manage. And he was sleeping, there's no electricity. He was sleeping on the floor. And he was so happy, he said, I can finally sleep tonight. So there's that kind of community activism or engagement that is also hopeful. Uh, of course, the power imbalance is so, uh, big that uh you know they live never sleeps never miss a chance that i'm not sure what what kind of uh, outcomes you know uh, or, or things would pan out out of this and that's the thing you know some of these changes would be permanent and some would be temporary we don't know which ones would be you know permanent and which ones uh, would uh, finally stick uh and now it's not just uh, the question I want to raise, and I think we will share, uh, is not just what's the role of anthropologists in a time like this, but in particular, what's the role of public anthropologists in a time like this? And I think, not just because David, you are, and I am, and I know some of you also are public uh, anthropologists, uh, but, you know, from what I've been telling you, you know, issues of human rights, uh, social suffering, structural violence, really go very well with the concerns of our public anthropology. So, uh, what do you think? You know, what, what kind of things can you see public anthropologists doing or engaging in? That's my question. Uh, I, I wanna stop here because I wanna hear from everybody. I know everybody has the same anxieties and everybody might have something to say. So uh, feel free. Thank you so much, Roberto. Um, what I'm, I think I'll, I'll leave the uh, mute button on for everyone, but everyone can unmute themselves. Uh, so just feel free. You can also raise your hand with the raise hand feature. Um, that's if you click on the manage participants, um, you'll see it at the bottom right hand uh, side of your screen. Who would like to respond first to, to Roberto's question about what should public anthropologists be doing in this moment? I have even something more provocative, which is one of the things of public anthropology is the speaking truth to power, right? What is people in power are so shameless that they don't give a fuck? What's the use of that? I'm not saying it's useless, but I, I we have a lot of people we have to engage, right? So that's my follow-up question. Oh, don't be intimidated. Oh, there you are. Mm. Roberto is very... <laughs> He's, he's very low risk, so um, yeah, like he said, don't be intimidated. Say something, David, you are up. Uh, we have, we have someone who wanted to jump in. I think, um, Dong, you should go ahead. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for getting us started to talk about this very important topic. So my question is, this is really a teaching moment you know, because I'm teaching race, gender class in the United States. And uh, how do you think I can integrate this moment into my student assignments? 
and to let them figure out, you know, reflect on what's happening. Because the other day I told my students, we are writing history right now. So mm -hmm. what do we want to leave behind? So I just want to see how, if it's a better way for me to integrate this without really making students feel kind of intimidated. No, so. listen, you could simply ask them uh, about their personal experience to report about how they are coping with this and then to see how, you know, uh, other people may be different gender, different class, uh, different uh, ethnic or racial background might be uh, responding. It would be easier for them to cope, harder for them to cope in relation to when you went through. I think you have a medic very whites and middle class kind of uh, student body there, right? So, uh, but they're not, they're critical. They're not, you know, they are people that are engaged. So I'm sure they're really aware of these issues. So the privilege they might have relative, right? Because we're all stuck in this. Yeah. Uh, so just ask them, you know, uh, describe how you are coping and then reflect about how race, class and gender may shape different experiences for people living in, in the same city or in the same country. And that, that's an easy assignment that I think they can totally do. Uh, okay. And in yeah. Life. yeah, thank you. Thank you so much because I'm, I'm trying to revise all my assignments because we are now moving, you know, to the remote teaching type of what thing. What are you teaching? Uh, race gender class. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's you're sorry, you yeah. told me that. So that's really it's helpful. perfect, right? Yeah. I mean, if you, if you buy my argument that uh, people experience uh, the coronavirus pandemic differently depending where, where they are in society, you know, uh, well, if you buy that, it's an easy assignment. If you okay. think that it doesn't matter, maybe it doesn't make sense to ask them about that because they're going to say, oh, everybody's suffering or everybody's in whatever, freaking out or everybody's in their yacht. No. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, to, I would want to just say that it's important to think about that not all students right now are white and middle class, and that no, 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 no. sure. Uh, oh no, no. But the point I want to make is that it's especially difficult to make as a teachable moment when a lot of us are one. This is a very new crisis, and two, people are still figuring out the kind of food, clothing, shelter hierarchy, and so trying to figure out how I can articulate that and like a anthropological theoretical framework is a thing I'll think about. I think when everything else is stable but it can be hard to try and think about how to make this the most anthropological moment at a more vulnerable position. Yeah, but we always, we, I think uh, all of us always want our students to reflect into the deeper social dynamics, but based, if possible, in their own experience. So that's the starting point what they know and what they know is when they go through and from there they build and then we build uh, on top of that so it's uh let me go it, that's the assignment i would do actually if i would be teaching if i teach medical anthropology i'm not teaching this semester uh hopefully for next uh, by next semester this thing is over but if it's not over they're gonna get that assignment Okay, thank you. Who else would like to jump in? Roberto, maybe, maybe I can sort of ask a question that in a way responds to your question, doesn't really provide an answer. Yeah, people can Nobody ask. has an answer. Um, but, um, or to one of, one of your, I think both of your questions are really important. And I, I should just point out, I, I was supposed to record this from the beginning, but we are recording this because there are some classes, at least one class and, and multiple classes actually, that would like to, um, would have liked to have anticipated tonight, but, but weren't able to. So we're going to share it with them, just so you know. But, um, you know, I, my, my, this is sort of an impression, but my, my sense is that, that anthropologists haven't done a whole lot in terms of a response. I'm sure there are, there are many who have, but, um, and I have some impression that, you know, anyone, um, you know, in biology, chemistry, anyone who has any expertise in the sciences that could possibly help bring about the end of the pandemic more quickly is applying their skills to try to do that. And I fear that anthropologists aren't. And I fear, or, and, and I guess if, if I was to 
answer any part of your question about what we should be doing. I would think that we should be very present oriented or, um, you know, the long term understanding of the pandemic is important and will be important. But any ways in which we could bring our skills to bear that would actually reduce suffering, immediate suffering um, in one way or another, uh, that that should be our priority. It's hard. Unfortunately, uh, we are not Paul Farmer. First, because he's brilliant, uh, and second, because, and most importantly, because he's a physician. So our skills, I, maybe that's my personal bias, but our skills are more, uh, less practical, let's put it like that. Right? So, uh, but we can do a lot in terms of not just criticizing, you know, it, it's not just saying uh, everything is wrong in the system, but also we know that certain things uh, or certain public policy recommendations could really enhance the response. Not, it's probably too late for this uh, pandemic, but there's always a next one. So, you know, we know that if we house people, then social distancing, beca distancing becomes easier. That they, if we provide them with food, it might be easier. If we give them healthcare, it, pro it becomes easier. If we don't punish uh, people undocumented uh, while they're going to healthcare settings, then it protects everybody. So how to generate policy recommendations that are based in evidence uh, you know that that would be really good. I think we. I I don't like personally uh, the idea of engaging in policy recommendations because I'm a very cynical person and I know I think that some everybody knows what should be done but nobody gives a fuck. I mean, people in power doesn't care, but other people say no, 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 no. Uh, you have to be persistent and sometimes it trickles down. This time it really trickles down. Something might happen down the line. So that's the policy avenue, right? Uh, we should engage more with other disciplines. And of course, when we are engaging with other disciplines, like epidemiologists and public health practitioners, we can not talk in the way we usually talk among themselves. I'm not one of the worst offenders. I think I'm very straightforward. But it's not the, you know, we know, you know the lingua, I don't have to mock them or anything. It's just, bring our best, you know, what we know, the experiences of people, you know, how our observations can fit into policy that can, you know, make something happen. Um, it's a challenge. It's a very big challenge because ethnographers in particular, we work alone. We don't collaborate with other anthropologists, let alone with other disciplines. And then we talk in a way that is very insular and provincial and cryptic, very weird. It doesn't help. So we have to really make a, an effort to understand a language that is not our language. If we're going to talk with public health practitioners, it's going to be in their language, not in our language. That's fine because we have a strategic goal, but we have to be smart in how we approach these things. I have practice in the sense that I've been working with uh, ethicists, uh, physicians, you know, public health practitioners. Uh, it's a skill that we can develop. We are not done. I think we haven't paid enough attention uh, to, to these needs. It, I mean, you know, policy recommendations, it's easier, it's very easy to leave them aside, to push them aside, not to look at them, especially for people in power. You know, I have the sense, and again, this is my cynical side, that people in power ask for policy recommendations and they all only follow them if you tell them to do what they already wanted to do, if you are providing a, a legitimation to a course of action that they had already established, then they like your recommendation, they like you. And if they don't, you are being shut down or shut off or just ignored. But uh, that's my cynical part. And maybe I, I shouldn't, I, I'm the worst advocate for this line of work actually. But as I said, there's people that have been working in policy for a long, long time from the anthropology, the, you know, anthropology or sociology that are more hopeful. And I really believe then when they said it might trickle down, uh, something might happen down the line. You don't know, you start something now and maybe in 10 years, you know, it picks up. Maybe it's not for this pandemic. Maybe it's not for the next one either, the next one. So, uh, 
David, I wish we were physicians. I wish I could go to an emergency room and do something, but uh, observing at that point as, an, as a medical anthropologist, it, you know, it's a, it's a pain. No, like, no, they're fighting for their lives. I think that's, that's not the right moment to do ethnography in, in these very complex settings. So maybe maybe others have have a a, a response to to your question or, or want to ask Roberto any any questions I I, I would be happy they, to. they might feel better about policy than I do <laughs> I, I might I might be, be uh, yeah more on the policy train but but I, I think your um, concerns are are important Elizabeth did you yes I have a question <laughs> Yeah. Hi, um, I am sorry, I was a little late. I had in my head that it was eight o'clock, um, no. but I, um, I, <laughs> so I'm sorry, I missed the beginning, but I wanted to ask you, um, I was listening to an interview on Democracy Now! and they were talking about um, how different cultures have responded differently, and one, how this may not be your expertise, I don't know, about how climate change um, is making us closer to animals, which creates, uh, so when we're closer to animals, the diseases can pass more easily from animals to humans um, because we're taking over animal space. But the other thing they were saying was that a lot of cultures have had an ability to, like Singapore, different cultures have, got, have had different abilities on how to handle the pandemic and been successful in different ways. So like Singapore, they were saying that they were able to contain the pandemic without even canceling schools. And you know, in our culture, we don't have a centralized healthcare system that public health system that will address the issue. Um, do you have any comments on how different, you know, and China is out of lockdown now? Do you have any comments on how different cultures have been able to squash the pandemic more easily? Good questions, than right? So the first is the environmental uh, dimensions, whether our closer proximity to nature may endanger us. And the answer is yes, but it's not just an abstract proximity to nature. It's our capitalist mode of production that is relentless and doesn't stop and keep, you know, bringing people into cities and um, larger cities and, you know, advancing into forests and environments that uh, were traditionally separated. So that separation is shrinking. So that places everybody at, at risk. For the dif how different societies respond, uh, yeah, you know, it's funny. Uh, some people were saying two months ago, one month ago, when we had no cases here and almost no cases in Europe either, how authoritarian regimes were able to mobilize resources or impose conditions that we would never do. And then you look at Italy and Wuhan, and you can see almost no difference in, this, in the sense that they are adopting a very, very strict regime. So, uh, as always, you know, people take the lessons they want to take from this pandemic. Uh, people were saying, oh, Chinese are authoritarian. Of course they are. Uh, Asians are more communitarian. You know, they care. This is a very, our society and European, you know, the French uh, are also very individualistic. They have the thing about uh, liberté, that's freedom, freedom. Mm -hmm. like, equality and freedom is in their like DNA and they had trouble disciplining people. They have to, you know, uh, police them really heavily. So, but there's something about political regimes and that's an, maybe an uncomfortable truth. Uh, they might do a better job because they provide health care for everybody. They provide the conditions, food for everybody. China built in Wuhan a hospital for 1000 people in 10 days. And we are thinking in New York, should we use the Javits Center? Should we, <laughs> I don't know what. Like, what about letting everybody go to the hospitals? Mm. And then everybody's gonna nationalize the hospitals. They did that in Spain. Nationalize healthcare, nationalize this. Not even Medicare for all. Nest, nest, not right now, nationalize healthcare. And they, you know, Trump said the other day, we need masks, we need respirators, we're gonna ask, uh, you know, the, auto, the automakers to build that, uh, to, we, no, no, sorry, that's, that's not it. He said, we're gonna nationalize the production. And then the automaker said, no, we can do it ourselves. And Trump said, oh, fine, you wanna help. You know, you could nationalize stuff, you could, you can adopt very serious measures that would change the outlook of our economy and our society. 
But that's not what the people that have control in this society want. They want to further their own, their own agendas. And that's, of course, you know, the, the debates, you know, how far can we go? How far should we go? Uh, capitalism is awful uh, for many things, but it also kills in a pandemic. There's people that doesn't need to die, that are gonna die because nobody bothered to produce enough respirators or masks mm, before a pandemic. There's no value in there. You know, you just place them somewhere. They, lead, they need the circulation. Capitalists need the circulation of capital. You know, just producing a million masks and leaving them somewhere just in case somebody needs them. That's not a good, that's not their business model. They like to produce and reproduce stuff endlessly and find new markets and new needs and new stuff. Just producing respirators just in case or masks just in case, that's not good. And also charging for healthcare is an awesome business. But if you do that, a lot of people are, are gonna be left untreated. Uh, if you can get your own island or your own cruise or your own shrimp boat, then you're fine. But for the rest of us, it's a danger for everybody. So it's not just different cultures that respond differently, but different socioeconomic systems that really endanger or uh, support life in different ways. I feel that I, I really hate, I, you know, my wife mocks me because I, I make fun of Xi Jinping all the time. Uh, I, 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 I live through a dictatorship. I'm from Uruguay, so I live until I, from the six, from six years old to 17, I lived through a dictatorship. I hate authoritarian regimes, and I really hate Xi Jinping. But on the other hand, they build this hospital, and they didn't charge anybody, and they distribute amazing amounts of resources, and you know, they police you, yes. They surveil you in a way that we don't, yet we might. Uh, but they mobilize resources in a way that wasn't calculating profits, for example. Um, so maybe, you know, the, there's something to be said about these other regimes that provide housing or health care or basic needs. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to go in a rant. Uh, Who would like to jump in next? Don't be shy even in this virtual space. Exactly, if you are shy in a virtual space, you, you would always be shy. Fight. I could, I could add maybe one little comment that I had. Um, so I think that in terms of what anthropologists can do or what we are doing, mm -hmm. um, our department itself is organizing kind of a network to be able to support each other. And I think that in these times, sometimes even just supporting each other on that smaller level, so like anthropologists supporting other anthropologists or supporting our students um, can be one very practical, urgent thing that we are doing and that we can do. Um, and I also, um, one question that I've been asking myself too is, uh, these problems that we're noticing with the healthcare system have been kind of called out for a long time by many different groups, like people with disabilities, working class people, trans people, LGBTQ community, et cetera. Um, and why, why is it, and I think some of what you're um, talking about also was speaking to why you know people with privilege are now freaking out whereas like people have been freaking out for a long time and um those and the same people that have been calling out these issues are some of the most vulnerable people and so i think um that's just something that i've been thinking about on my own and also um yeah just going back to my first thought just supporting each other um, knowing that we're all of different risk groups, um, things like that has been a powerful moment, I think, for at least on a small scale for anthropologists in our department, maybe. 
Sure, and I think these kind of meetings through internet, Zoom, you know, uh, are therapeutic in a way. I feel better now than I felt uh, an hour ago. So, you know, we need to talk about these issues, the frustrations we have. I have a many, many frustrations. I'm a very frustrated Marxist. You know, if you're a Marxist, you're always frustrated because you, you know how shitty things are and you know things could be better and probably won't, uh, not, not around the corner at least. So I'm a very kind of a frustrated person, but I, I feel great about having this conversation and having this opportunity to talk to you. And also, uh, as, I, I, as I'm, I want to warn you that my vision, it's kind of a radical vision in a way. You know, some people might, might be, maybe in a different situation or different, you know, continuum of care or, you know, political uh, stuff, that's fine. Don't, 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 if, if there's something I said that is useful for you, take it. If it's not useful, well, fine, fine. I think I saw a couple, of, B, I saw your hand. Um, were you, I'm not sure if you were pointing to, the comment you made or you wanted to make a new comment and then James <clears throat> um, I can go if B okay yeah, and maybe B you can um, write me in the chat box and B B's um, vocal uh, cords are not working so well tonight as a result of illness so um go ahead James and then B do let me know what I what I can pose yeah, I, um, so I just, I had something, uh, and you kind of touched on it as well, is um, I really do think that, like, these are issues that people have been talking about for a long time, and, I mean, you're really only as, like, the people themselves are only uh, as healthy in terms of insurance as the sickest person, because, you know, if we're going to live in a any any sort of society i think that there's some sort of uh like i i feel like there should be a pro i mean even even in a capitalist society do you know why there wouldn't be a profit motive or an incentive to keep people healthy to build these things like respirators if we know we're going to need them um possibly at some point and um i mean because you know to to keep like be this pandemic has destroyed the economy. Um, so why would there not, like, I'm, I'm just, I'm just kind of astounded that there really isn't more of a, I guess, drive to keep everyone healthy and why, uh, I mean, you know, all these capitalists, uh, that own, uh, especially in terms of like the, uh, health insurance and hospitals, why, why they don't have more of a, uh, a stake in, you know, I guess, helping everyone, including uh, people in lower classes than them. There's something about the centralized economy, the, you know, uh, a planned economy, where you can say a five-year plan, like the Russians did, like the Chinese did, that the Chinese still do, that you can say, this is what we need to function. And then you allocate resources and responsibilities, and then you get that, you know, how many masks, how many respirators we would need, how many hospital beds would we need, how many schools would we need, and so on and so on. But the market economy is not like this, and it's very dysfunctional in the sense that it's supply and demand. Let's say there's a scarcity of masks. Then the price goes up. Then over time, you see people do, producing millions of masks, many more masks than people would need. Then the price goes down. And for a while, nobody produces that because there's no profit in it. And then if you have another epidemic, you don't have them. So the capitalist system is really, really bad for that. Uh, now, there are differences, right? Uh, the, all the European countries and Canada and Japan and Australia, they have a national health care system. Be, because they care. It's not that they're better capitalists with a better heart than the Americans. It's just that they understood, you know, with Bismarck uh, in the 1870s, that it was good for corporations and for businesses to have a healthy workforce and also for the army. You cannot fight a war. You cannot become an empire with people that cannot fight because they are too sick. So they understood that it was a social investment that they needed to do and they still need to do. It's not that they are better people than us, more altruistic. No, it's a different software for running a capitalist system 
what the system is designed to do there is similar to what the system is designed to do here, but they, it runs on a different program. You know, that's why they have a, a welfare state. The welfare state is not just out of the goodness of their heart, it's self-interest. And also the, work, the, the, the struggles of the working class that push them to do that. At the end, they realized that it was good for the working class, but also was really good for them as well. You know, the, the, the American companies could be more competitive if they didn't have to pay for healthcare. If it was a national healthcare system, then the healthcare cost, you know, could be out of their pocket, uh, pockets, and then it would become more competitive with a German company that doesn't have to, you know, afford uh, pay for their employees' healthcare. So it, it makes good business sense, and that's good because that's why they the things get implemented. Um, you know. Uh, it's crazy. We could subsidize, you know, one, th one, way, one way of getting more masks or more respirators is subsidizing them. You could say, okay, I'm going to pay you to produce this and I'm going to store this and I'm going to subsidize this production. You could do the same thing with uh, drugs, with many other things that are vital. The capitalist system, it's awful. You know, we, we outsource uh, everything to China. So now our masks come from China. I mean, theoretically, because they have to shut down, uh, since they shut down, and also they have, you know, 1,500 uh, million people there, they need masks for that huge population and respirators and everything. So we didn't produce anything here. The same thing is going on in Europe. They are realizing that they have to bring some of that production back. It's a national security issue, it's a health issue, right? So some of the changes, some of these changes might happen in the future. We don't know now, as I mentioned before, which kind of changes are gonna stick and which ones are not. I think that's the beauty of it. I mean, if there's a, an upside in this epidemic is that it's, it's gonna change potentially many, many things. Some for the good and some for the bad or the worst. Let's see how, how, uh, how things you know, played out and also try to see if we can have a small, small role in, you know, in the good uh, part of the outcomes uh, here. Let me just read B's, um, B's made a couple comments, but um, uh, most recently B pointed out, capitalism pushes the idea that there's only so much to go around, dividing up a pie rather than asking how we make enough pie to ensure everyone who wants, needs pie, get some. And previously, hopefully everyone can see the, the chat box, but um, B pointed out uh, some of her work doing refugee resettlement program evaluations help my agency get ready for multiple audits. Um, my, try, my attempt to understand my own privilege helped advocate for clients to get services they needed like medical interpretation. I think sort of referring to the question of what skills we could bring to bear. Let me see if others want to jump in. We, are, we have reached a little bit after eight. Um, if Roberto can stay a little bit longer, um, sure. it would be great to continue the conversation. Uh, if folks need to um, depart. You can always reach me. You can always reach me. Uh, so. so maybe just because I'm, Roberto and I are, are, are friends now going on 20 years or, uh -huh. yeah, going on 20 years, yes. which is exciting. Yeah. Um, I, I, can, I can push back on on one thing, um, because in, in many ways, I do think we have a, a, a planned economy, and you know, this probably comes from my you know, focusing on the, the military and the military industrial complex and mm. the money that's been plowed into that system um, in a, a, a highly socialized kind of way, um, while uh, including for um, an excellent healthcare system that takes care of those uh, military personnel and ensures they're, they're at least in theory, ready to, to fight. Um, uh, and uh, so I, you know, I, I see the, the, the poor state of our public health care system as, um, as certainly related to and a reflection of the trillions of dollars that have been poured into a, a, a military state, a, um, a permanent warfare state, while, while um, we have had no welfare state to, to speak of. Um, and, and while we've created a, a de facto public health 
or de facto healthcare system that has been become the most expensive in the world with some of the worst health outcomes, um, as you know, Bernie Sanders and many others have, have pointed out. Um, but of course, where you know, where does that ex expensiveness go? It it like it goes back to what where where you started. Someone's benefiting um, mm -hmm. from that. Um, someone is benefiting from the great expense that um, has been incurred by by uh, U.S. Uh, by everyone in the United States. Insurers are asking for a bailout. Hospitals are asking for a bailout. Everybody that can ask for a bailout is asking for a bailout. I, if I wish, I, if I could, I, I also would ask for a bailout. It's kind of crazy, you know. Uh, and then, you know, set the shock doctrine. They are always uh, using crisis to further their own interests, uh, and it's so shameless. And you can see them um, operating, you know. Uh, so so clearly, I think that's a you know epidemics are nasty things, but at least they make uh, the workings of a society more transparent. It's not that with Trump it wasn't transparent enough. I think it was pretty obvious. But there's another dimension that I see we can you know you, we can start to see uh, because of this pandemic. It's uh, it's not radically new. It's not that it was a virtual system that. You know, finally we see that the emperor is naked and the system is, is shitty. No, it was a shitty system that was very shameless. Um, and now uh, we can see how it's even more shameless than we thought possible. I don't want to sound depressing. I, again, I, I totally apologize for this because one thing is that you are anxious about things. And another thing is that I make you depressed. I don't want to do that. <laughs> Would it be helpful to be more outraged? Maybe that's, you we know. That, but we are too nice, David. You know, the, the, the Tea Party. What's the Tea Party? Rage. The Trump voters. Rage. And we are, we wonder about things. No, we have to be fucking pissed off at the bailout, at everything, you know. Uh, rage is good. I think rage is good. Uh, but you have to feel it. You cannot fake it. You know, the, the right, they are authentically enraged. Uh, and I'm not saying they have no reason, uh, you know, they are just not understanding that uh, Trump is a perfect con man, you know, and I got this from Noam Chomsky. He says he's a brilliant person in the sense that he carries the agenda of the elite against the interest of the poor. And he manages to convince his base that he's on his side, on their side. That's an amazing political like move, right? But they, they are, they are, um, anger and their frustration is genuine. And I think we have to match that. If we are gonna match that, we need people that are pissed off and not nice. Bernie is too nice. I mean, I, for, sorry, I shouldn't say this. That's a, a political, totally political, political, political thing. I, I didn't wanna enter into like a, of course, my work is very political, but it's not obviously partisan. At least I shall say what I said. <laughs> Let me just see if if um, might get an, another yeah comment or question or two. Go ahead, Lynn. I just figured out how to participate. <laughs> I just figured out how to unmic myself. I'm sorry. Um, thank Are you, you enraged? So What's that? Are you enraged? I'm exhausted, so it's a little hard. It's a problem. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, yeah, of course. Good. Um, but uh, thank you so much for hosting this, David, and for speaking to us, Roberto. Uh, everyone here, I believe, is so fortunate to, to hear from both of you. You've covered a lot of important stuff. Um, and and I know personally the the history that you you bring to this, um, and I'm thinking about 9/11 in particular, oh, and shit. I'm thinking about um, um, the question of what teachers can do, um, and what anthropologists can do, and the comment about supporting each other. And I I really want to emphasize how important I think that is, and how we are 
we're storytellers. The anthropologists are, mm -hmm. we collect stories. And there are endless stories right now to be collected. And as teachers, you know, as Roberto said, that's, that's it. That's all you got to do right now. You just got to, you know, ask your students to be anthropologists, to do autoethnography, to be talking about their own experiences, to be talking about whether they feel that they're in a position of privilege or they know that they're not in a position of privilege. Um, they're going to, you know, as Americans, I don't even like saying as Americans, but as people who live here in this country, uh, we all have some connection to people of all different positions, right, in relationship to power. And so with every student, you get, you know, a network of, mm -hmm. of other stories that are available to them. And just a quick look at the New York Times today, my gosh, I, I saw a story about, you know, a domestic worker, a nanny who had been, you know, just told to, to leave after working, you know, for years raising the kids of this family who had hired her and who had even made her go for a, a driving test with them before hiring her. And, and she's saying like, you know, and then they just let me go without any formality. Not that there should have been formality to begin with, right? So a story like that, that's just one in a million. And that's a reporter. As mm -hmm. anthropologists, we have the skills to, to dig deep and to make the connections that Roberto's making here today, you know, and, and that David's been doing both of these. You, you guys have great leaders here. So, you know, take a look at their work. Um, and uh, yeah, use, use the, the population of students that you have um, to start doing your own work on this because, yeah, you're going to have years and years and years of reflection and data to keep working with. You just got to get it, right? That's it. Thank you. So good. So good. I like this, the, the storytelling. And, you know, we are storytellers. You are totally right. And sometimes I, and forgive me for doing this, I, I see people dying of overdose on a daily basis, people that struggle with things, I, you know, you cannot imagine. And I become very bleak. And sometimes you wonder, what's the use of everything you do or I do, uh, but there's a use of uh, giving their, their, them voices and narrating what they're going through and placing that in context and making an argument. Not for people in power, because as I mentioned, they don't give a fuck, but for themselves, for ourselves and for other people that don't know and maybe are in position to do something. I, thank you again. I don't wanna be bleak, but it's almost my default mode. But I, I, I think we probably should, in a moment, give um, Roberto a big round of applause. And then maybe for if folks want to ask some individual questions, you could hang on the line as long as Roberto has a couple more moments. Um, but I do want to just say, I, I don't think you have been bleak, because I think you've, you've shown us a way in which anthropologists and other caring human beings can, can show in this moment of pandemic who's benefiting and who's suffering. And that we have we have a role to play in identifying both, and I mean that's one of the things your your book did so powerfully. Um, while other people, you know, have other contributions to make, like like Lynn, who on a daily and hourly basis is helping people who surely are in moments of of mental health crisis, and in many cases, or in other cases, she's I'm sure helping them get through their days as, as best they can. Um, so I think we all have different roles to play. And um, I wanna thank Roberto for, for providing us a model and uh, some paths forward, as well as a, an analysis of this really confusing, complicated, disorienting moment uh, and I, that I feel um, uh, better informed about now and, and, and inspired. So let's give Roberto a big round of applause. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. It was great for me. Uh, great to see seeing you, David, seeing Lynn, uh, so many friends. Uh, again, I, I, I feel really good about uh, being able to do this. If you need me again, um, you know, just give me a shout and I'll be there.
Welcome to our conversation with Dr. 